it's so wonderful to look out and see the audience filled with Alowans, friends, friend, friends of the school, uh, and what a, what a happy occasion. My name is Cleve Gilmore. I'm the Dean of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, and it's my great honor to formally welcome you uh, here today to this very special event where we are going to recognize the appointment of Professor Alowen Townsend as the Ralph S. and Dorothy P. Schmidt Professor. I have to make sure that I look down and get the full title. <laughs> it's very important, right, Terry? Yes, yes, we, we learned that as deans to get that right. And a special welcome to Professor Peter Garlock, uh, Alowen's husband, uh, who's here. Uh, we were just sharing baseball stories, uh, <laughs> uh, hoping that uh, the Cleveland Indians would have, been, would have been our topic of conversation, but uh, we're, we're baseball fans, and uh, it's always, always nice to see Peter here. I want to start by first expressing my appreciation and gratitude for the late Dorothy Schmidt's commitment to our community. She worked on multiple boards. She was on the uh, Board of Trustees of Western Reserve University. She was on the board of our school, uh, school, the School of Applied Social Sciences. And she formed a very close relationship with our former dean, Terry Hockenstadt. And so this school was a passion for Dorothy Schmidt. She believed in the work of the school. She was a noteworthy do donor to the university and this school. She helped establish the Leonard W. Mayo Professor of Family and Child Welfare, and the Henry L. Zucker Professor of Social Work Practice, in addition to the Ralph S. and Dorothy P. Schmidt Professor, which was established in honor of her husband, Ralph. <coughs> Dorothy Sport Support has helped the school to grow to become one of the top-ranked schools of social work in the nation. So it's, this shows the, the value of these special gifts that people give. At the time they give, the, give it, we tell them, this is a gift in perpetuity. We are guaranteeing you that we are going to have a scholar of a, a top eminence who is going to be working at the school, and it's made possible by this wonderful gift that you're giving. So while Dorothy and her husband and family members are not here with us now, it's appropriate for us to still thank her and recognize her and her family for this wonderful commitment that they made to the school and its lasting benefit. And the, the person who actually made this happen was our own Dean Terry Hockenstad, who went and spoke to Dorothy Schmidt about the value of this, this gift. And I'd like to ask Terry Hockenstadt, the emeritus Ralph S. and Dorothy P. Schmidt professor, to come forward. Terry? Thank you, Cleve. Great to see a number of uh, community colleagues, as well as alumni, students, and faculty here for this august occasion. It, it certainly is an august occasion. Obviously, I want to start out my remarks by congratulating Dr. Professor Alowen Townsend, a friend and a colleague who I've had the pleasure of working with over some years now uh, to assume this professorship, the Rolf S. and Dorothy P. Schmidt Professor at MSAS at Case Western Reserve University. Dean Gilmore has told some of my thunder, but I'm going to repeat a few of the things that he had to say, because I had the great pleasure of knowing and working with Dorothy Prentice Smith over a decade and a half in the 1970s and early 80s. And she provided the endowment to make this professorship possible in 1980. Both Dorothy and her husband, Rolf, were true citizens of Cleveland 
as well as supporters of Case Western Reserve University. Dorothy served as vice chair of the university board of trustees when it was still Western Reserve University and was there and participated in the merger of Western Reserve University in the case Institute of Technology. And for her work at that time, as well as her prior help with the university, she received the Doctor of Humane Letters, the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from the university. So she and her husband, Rolf, were very active in the arts, in healthcare, as well as in higher education. And they represented the very best of noblesse oblige in her, their dedication of time and talent, as well as resources, to this university and many of the social agencies which participate in our program here at MSAS. Dorothy Schmidt, known as her, from her, with her good friends as Doe, was particularly active at MSAS. She became chair of the visiting committee of MSAS, and I had an opportunity to work with her on many projects over the years, and uh, was a main contributor to our program during the 1970s. She was quiet but forceful. She effectively moved the agenda forward in our visiting committee meetings. And in 1977, we, then SAS, awarded her the Distinguished Service Award for outstanding dedication and service to the school. It was a great pleasure to work with her over many projects during that period of time. Unfortunately, her husband, Rolf, had passed from this earth uh, years earlier, so she was by herself. But she lived in Moreland Courts, and she became a friend to my wife, Dorothy, and myself. We were invited to dinner several times, and then one summer, we were invited to Cape Cod, to the Schmidt uh, 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 summer house uh, there, so we got to know uh, Dorothy very well during that period of time. <clears throat> the Schmidt Chair was established in 1980, and I was honored by the university to be installed in the chair in the presence of Dorothy Schmidt. She was a true friend of this school who contributed time and talent as well as resources to its mission and its program. And so it's certainly appropriate today we recognize her as well as her husband, Rolf, on this very important occasion. Thank you, Terry. It's nice to give the personal connections that you were able to relate um, about uh, Dorothy Schmidt. Hello, we're about to start the formalities. Come on forward. Professor Townsend joined the Mandel School faculty in 2001. In looking over her curriculum vitae, we see many honors that she received. Uh, the first that I noted uh, as a uh, member of the faculty was in 1996 when you received a distinct, distinguished lectureship in aging from the Institute on Aging at the University of S South Florida. Most recently, in 2016, Professor Townsend was awarded the Researcher of the Year by the Ohio Association of Gerontology Education at their 40th annual conference. She's also a distinguished teacher, and that was recognized by her reception of the DECOF Award for Distinguished Graduate Teaching here at Case Western Reserve University. And my colleagues on the faculty know um, that is a, a rare distinction at this university and, and one that is, is hard earned. And based on these achievements, we want to recognize Alowan with an induction into the Mandel School Hall of Achievement. And I'm presenting you with a certificate of such, 
uh, on this day. So and we're going to pause for a picture. <laughs> there we go. On okay, cue. So on cue, we have the Hall of Achievement. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, it says here to present alone with the certificate and to pause to have the picture taken. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. Okay. So I, I, I turned over that. The, uh, I'm very interested in, in hearing Al Alone's presentation because I know that she's, she's crafted a, a wonderful presentation today for you on her work. Her primary research interests are in adult development and aging, family relationships, mental and physical health, and the interface between families and formal service systems. Her current research investigates the impact of cancer and comorbidities on psychosocial quality of life of middle-aged and older adults. It's the dean's responsibility to identify a member uh, whom the dean f feels is qualified and deserving of the prominence of a, an endowed chair. I didn't look far to find a loan. In fact, I looked across the hall, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I looked across the hall. Uh, I did share my decision with the other professors of the school. And 201, they applauded that decision because they recognized in their colleague a scholar who has not only contributed deeply to the literature, but one who's been a colleague, generous of her time in helping others, and very generous in working with students. Students who were formerly her students, but any student who came by her way, whether it was a doctoral student or a master's student, alone was ready to work with them and to find ways to create a strong nurturing experience for that student, not only with her, but within the school. And, and for that, I'm very grateful. When I speak with individuals about my decision to nominate them to President Snyder to serve as professor, I point out that much is expected of a professor, especially an endowed professor. And alone has already taken on that heavy mantle, and I know that she's going to carry it well and continue forward and continue to contribute not only to the scholarly liter literature, but also to the life of all of us at the Mandel School and in our greater Cleveland community. So thank you very much, Lowen, and now I'm turning it over to you, okay. and we're li listening for your remarks. Well, I will set this down. Thank you so much, Cleve, and I am deeply honored and humbled, a little overwhelmed by having so many friends and colleagues here. Um, I just want to start my timer because I really don't want to keep you here for the rest of the evening. It's easy once you start talking about research to you know, just go on and on and on. And um, I really want to make sure that we also have time to celebrate because I think this is definitely a an occasion for celebration. So I will uh, try to do three things today in, in this presentation. One is to offer thanks, and I don't know quite how we got so far ahead there, but um, we'll go back. Uh, I, I want to offer thanks to all the many people that stand behind me because I did not achieve this career by myself. I've had so many people supporting me and contributing to whatever I have been able to do. So I want to offer some word of thanks to some of those people today first. And then secondly, I would like to tell you a little bit about my research, because I love research. <laughs> and uh, presumably, that's part of why you gave me this honor, Cleve. So I'll talk a little bit about my research, uh, particularly in the area of family care for older relatives. And then I want to use that as a springboard for trying to persuade you that even though we've had many, many, many studies on family caregiving, we still have more work to do. And in fact, I think it's a particularly pressing issue for our society uh, at this particular time. So those are my, those are my goals in uh, 40 minutes or less, hopefully. 
So uh, I want to begin with gratitude to Mr. and Mrs. Schmidt. You've heard about them. And it's certainly an honor to have a chair that was endowed by two people who were such gener generous philanthropists and community leaders. So I'm very honored by that. My thanks to Dean Gilmore for nominating me for this honor, of course, and to uh, Provost Bazelak, President Snyder, and the Board of Trustees, who, lucky for me, approved the, the appointment. I want to start with gratitude and love for my doctoral mentors. So these were two people, Pat Gurin and the late Joe Viroff, who were so instrumental in, in anything that I've achieved. And I must say that every time I walk into a new class at the start of a semester, I think about them because they were fantastic teachers, researchers, scholars, um, community members, and just all around human beings. I also mentioned some other faculty here at the University of Michigan through courses or mentorship that really had an impact on my professional development. In aging, I've been blessed by having phenomenal mentors and colleagues. So I wanted to single out Barbara Brickman, uh, Chandra Marotra, the late uh, Powell Lawton, and the late Len Perlin, and also Steve Zaret, who isn't pictured here because I actually acknowledge him on a later slide. So here, too, in the field of aging, I've just had phenomenal mentorship and, and support. So to my esteemed colleagues, many of you who are here, the faculty and staff at the Mandel School, my great thanks. I want to thank Marianne Lax, standing back there at the back, and all the staff that worked so hard to make this such a special occasion. I also want to thank Terry Hawkinstead, who was the inaugural Smith Chair and has been a very highly valued colleague in aging and colleague at the school. Big shoes to fill, Terry, so maybe I need to buy bigger, bigger ones, but <laughs> I will do my best. Um, I also have a number of colleagues, who, some of whom are here today. I've been very fortunate on this campus to have great fellowship and colleagues, particularly from the School of Nursing, the School of uh, the Department of Sociology, the School of Medicine, the Department of Psychology, the department formerly known as EpiBio, now renamed. Um, so I thank all of you for everything I've learned from you over the years. And to the master's students at the Mandel School, some of whom I'm so honored to have here today. I love your passion and commitment, I really do, and your, your interest in learning and growing and really becoming the best possible social workers. To my doctoral students, you've meant so much in my career. And by the way, there are seats up front, as we always say to our students, if any of you would <laughs> like, like to sit, please, please do come up if you'd like to sit. So um, all of the doctoral students that I've had the honor of teaching or mentoring, advising, doing research with, you're so important in my career. And I do single some of you out. Uh, it may embarrass you, but I'm gonna do it anyway as a good mentor. So um, I want to just take a moment to note the research of some of these students because I'm not going to talk about their research in my presentation because I'm focusing more on the research I've done. But Sung Jung Cho is working on a dissertation right now that looks at the effects of neighborhood level characteristics on depressive symptoms in older adults. Angela Curl, who is here actually today all the way from Miami, Ohio, did her dissertation on the effects of retirement by one or both spouses on self-rated physical health. And Tyrone Hamler is doing his research on uh, end-stage renal disease and uh, uh, kidney, kidney disease and dialysis. Karen Ischler, who's now a research associate at our school, did her dissertation on married couples who had pain, both partners in the couple had pain, looking at the impact of pain on functioning and on depressive symptoms. Uh, I also want to mention here uh, Zhang Wu Li, who's doing her dissertation right now, also looking at pain and depressive symptoms and whether or not that relationship can be either exacerbated or buffered by positive and negative interactions with a spouse. Here Moon, who's on the faculty now at University of Louisville, 
Uh, here did her dissertation. You'll hear a little bit about it in one slide. Uh, using data provided by Carol Whitlatch at the Benjamin Rose Institute. Uh, and Carol's here today, so thank you, Carol. Um, and that dissertation looked at whether or not caregivers and care recipients who had mild to moderate cognitive impairment uh, agreed or disagreed about various uh, matters. Young Sam Oh is now a faculty member at a university in South Korea, and Young Sam did his dissertation on predictors of online health information, seeking behaviors and experiences of elderly cancer survivors. Uh, Wei-Di Chen is doing her research currently on diabetes and physical activity. In Jung Shan is doing her dissertation and close to finishing it on uh, disparities that's right, isn't it, Anjan? Close to finishing, uh, right? <laughs> no pressure uh, in front of all these people. Uh, her dissertation is on health disparities among women uh, trying to look at uh, what predicts whether they have or have not ever had a mammogram, so preventive cancer care, in women who are Chinese, uh, Korean, or Vietnamese immigrants to the US. So uh, those are the ones I really want to single out. So I also really want to thank my major research collaborators and consultants over the years. One of the joys of my career has been collaboration, and I just feel so blessed to have worked with so many wonderful people on so many different research projects. So don't worry, I'm not going to name them all. But you see yourselves up here on the screen if you're here. And if not, I do want to honor each and every one of these collaborations. And I certainly don't want to skip the major funders. Um, the funders have been wonderful. I really appreciate the support they've provided for my research and the collaborative research that's been done. I point out here at the bottom that I only listed the grants where I was principal investigator or co-principal investigator or co-investigator. Um, so I've been very fortunate to have uh, funding. And there have been major community partners that I want to honor because a large part of my research uh, when it's been primary data collection has involved working with communi community partners. And you see at the bottom of the screen that they helped with one or more of those various research projects. And special gratitude, of course, to my husband Peter, to our families, and to some very dear friends, some of whom are in the audience today. So once upon a time, <laughs> long, long ago, way back in 1982, a young woman started a career in aging. And I think you can read that two ways, but I'm not going to go into that. So uh, started a career in aging, and her journey took her through many fascinating realms. And I list those realms up here. One of the joys of my career has been being able to explore research in lots of different areas, as the dean said things related to adult development, to aging, to family caregiving, to physical and mental health during the adult years, uh, to diversity by gender, race, and ethnicity in well-being. I've been able to make some contributions, I think, to the methodological issues that uh, have been seen in the field. And with the partnership of Barbara Berkman and Chandra Marotra, I was able for many years to be a participant in a training program to try to enhance the gerontological research capabilities of social work research from across the country. So these three questions have really motivated my research. I mean, one was simply basically getting a better understanding of the experiences of family members caring for an older person. Secondly, looking for what was missing in our current theories or uh, empirical evidence or in our strategies for doing research. And the third is, how can we take the knowledge that we might gain and apply it to improve the lives of both older adults and their family caregivers? So I'm going to show you on some of the next slides uh, some of the research that I've done, some of the publications and uh, I'll put up several examples on each slide of articles that deal with that particular theme or question. 
And I'm going to just single out a few of them to tell you a little bit more detail about what we did and why we did it. So one of the first questions that troubled me in caregiving when I first started in the field was if we only have cross-sectional studies, which we primarily did at that point, uh, what are we missing? So cross-sectional studies, for those of you that aren't in students right now, uh, simply means that it's a study where we only gather information once from someone. So I did begin a study way back in 1989, and uh, the other thing that troubled me at the time was not just the lack of empirical data on how family caregivers' well-being and particularly their mental health might be affected over time, but we didn't have good theoretical models for even posing hypotheses about what might happen. So I uh, introduced a wear and tear hypothesis and pitted that against a hypothesis that caregivers would adapt to their circumstances. So the wear and tear hypothesis basically argued that uh, over time as caregiving stresses accumulate, the mental health of the family caregiver would deteriorate. The da adaptation hypothesis on the other hand talked about there being psychological or interpersonal resources that caregivers might draw on to offset that um, adverse effect. So you see that in fact empirically I was able to demonstrate that both deterioration and adaptation or improvement occurred, but it was surprising to many people at the time because actually adaptation was much more common or improvement was much more common than uh, deterioration in family caregivers' mental health. And I was able to identify two key factors that predicted whether or not the family caregiver might experience uh, increased depressive symptoms. So one was their sense of subjective stress in caregiving, and if that was increasing, then their uh, depressive symptoms were increased over time. But the second was their perceived sense of effectiveness as a caregiver. And if that was eroded, then it was even more deleterious for their uh, mental health. And you see some other studies that pursued uh, this question over time. Another big question for me was, we had in the beginning so much research that only had a single family member who was interviewed or from whom data was collected. And so what are we missing by that? So again, an early study that I did uh, collected information from both an older person who was receiving care and that person's, one of that person's adult child caregivers. And I was looking to see whether or not they would agree on the caregiving network and the decision-making network uh, that the elder had. Because if we only interview one person, we're assuming that we'd get the same information as we would get from other family members. Well, we do get some of the same information, as you can see here. For example, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, both the older person and the adult child agreed on who the primary caregiver was. And on the general hierarchy of sources of support to the, to the, care, to the elder, um, they also agreed for the most part that the caregiving networks of widowed elders were much more diverse in their content, their composition, who was in them, than the networks, care networks of married individuals. But there were important things that they disagreed on. So they didn't agree on how many caregivers there were. Just you think a basic objective fact, but it's obviously not objective, it's subjective. So the elders reported significantly fewer caregivers than the adult child did. The elders also reported some different people in the network than the child did or left out certain people that the child put in. So the adult children were much more likely to mention extended kin as part of the caregiving networks than the elder was. And finally, they disagreed on the relative centrality or importance of people in the network. So maybe it's not surprising, but the adult child thought that they were much more central and their siblings were much more central or important in care to the elder than the elder said they were. So that's an interesting difference. Here, Moon's dissertation, which I mentioned earlier, looked at uh, these caregiving dyads where the care recipient had mild or moderate cognitive impairment or dementia, and looked and found that they disagreed on how important social relationships were for the care recipient. 
So they didn't agree. The care recipient said that social relationships with other people were much more important than the caregiver said they were for the care recipient. And that discrepancy was a significant predictor of lower quality of life for both the person with dementia and the caregiver. Another thing that's um, been of interest to me all along is that so much of our research in family caregiving looks at that as if that's the only thing someone's doing. Doesn't think about what other roles, particularly the women in the middle, might be trying to juggle at the same time as parent care or elder care. Um, in addition there, we had contradictory theoretical hypotheses that we were faced with. So some theories were predicting that having multiple roles would be deleterious, particularly to a woman's mental health. Other theories were predicting, no, it would be advantageous for a woman to have multiple roles because perhaps you could get some rewards or gratification from those other roles when things weren't going so well in one of them. So Marianne Stevens and I, Marianne Stevens was at Kent State University, now retired. Uh, Marianne and I did a major study on the so-called women in the middle. So these were women who were juggling four roles simultaneously. They were providing care to an older parent or parent-in-law. They had at least one child still living at home under the age of 25. They had to be employed at least part-time, if not full-time. And they were married and living with a spouse. So our question was, what's it going to be like for these women to try to do all of this? What stresses will they have in each of these four roles? And what rewards will they have in each of these roles? And you see there that we did find, in fact, some evidence that if you have stress across all four roles or any combination of those roles, it does have a more deleterious effect on the uh, adult daughter's uh, depressive symptoms again and also life satisfaction. So stress can accumulate across roles. On the other hand, when we looked for rewards and whether those could somehow offset the stress of parent care, the only role where we found that rewards mattered was in the employee role. So those daughters who had rewarding work to do for paid employment uh, had better mental health and better life satisfaction than those who did not, regardless of the level of stress in the parent care role. Then another area that I've looked at has really been what don't we know about families and formal services? So most families at some time will need to have some help from formal services. So we need to understand what that experience is like. Uh, Karen Ishler and I had the opportunity to work with colleagues in nursing and social work at Hospice of the Western Reserve to look at family caregiver strain and resources during home hospice care. So one of the things that we all agreed about as a team was that the social workers there in hospice home care did not have any systematic way of assessing the strain that the family caregivers might be experiencing or the resources that they could bring to bear to help them in this situation. So we developed a tool to do that. And then we were able through that tool to identify certain uh, protective factors and risk factors for strain in each of the five areas that we looked at. So financial strain, emotional strain, uh, physical strain, things like that. So you see here some of the um, benefits or some of the protective factors and risk factors. And we also wanted to use this tool to try to identify who were the caregivers who were experiencing the most cumulative strain. So that's a very important thing to know if you're going to be trying to help uh, people in a service setting is if resources are tight, who are the people that are going to need it most? Another big area that I worked on was with uh, an invitation from Steve Zaret to Marianne Stevens and myself and another colleague, Rick Green, to try to find out whether using adult day services for a, a relative with dementia could be beneficial for the family caregiver. So at the time, there was very contradictory evidence in the field. There were some studies that showed it is beneficial for the caregiver to use adult daycare. Other studies that said, no, it's not. And those studies that did not show a beneficial effect were beginning to be used by policymakers and funders to say, well, if it's not beneficial, we don't need to fund it. 
So this was very troubling. But we felt that there were some critical methodological flaws in the existing studies that we could design a more rigorous uh, design more rigorous study to try to see, give it a best chance to show any beneficial effect. And so you see that we did that. We collected uh, data for this in both New Jersey and Ohio. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I'm certainly happy to talk about it over a glass of wine, uh, <laughs> why we picked those two states. But uh, we were able to show, given this more rigorous research, that yes, there are beneficial effects for the family caregiver. And they occur in the short run, in the first three months of using adult daycare, but they persist for up to a year after that. So in 1989, my colleague Steve Zaret posed this provocative question. We're beginning to get a lot of research on family caregiving and stress. Do we need any more? And of course, that was really a straw man that he was posing. But I want to tell you why I think the answer is yes. It was yes in 1989 when he posed the question. And I think it's even more true, true now. So I'll just take a sip of water. And I'm not the only one that thinks so. So that's always reassuring. Um, in 2015, we had a major national survey, the first national survey that had been done to look at who are providing care to people age 50 and over. What are their characteristics? What kind of care are they providing? Done by the National Alliance for Caregiving and the AARP. In 2017, a major alliance of over 30 national organizations who are very concerned about the looming crisis of care for an aging population uh, came out with an issue brief, again, arguing for the importance of family caregiving, how essential it is. And the National Academy of Sciences, just before that, in 2016, published a major report on family caregiving. And these are some of the conclusions that the National Academies reached. So you can see that they argue that family caregivers are absolutely essential in facing this looming crisis of an aging population. That there are profound consequences both to the caregivers of doing this, but also to us as a society for relying so heavily on the family to bear these burdens. That um, it's not something that gets public recognition, this family caregiving. And as the last sentence there says, they really can't be expected to provide complex care and support without additional support from society. So just to pause for a second and define family caregivers, um, there's no consensus. So different people define family in different ways, and different people define caregiving in different ways. The most common definition is to look for someone who's assisting another person with the so-called activities of daily living, like bathing, dressing, feeding, or instrumental activities of daily living, as they're called, things like shopping, paying bills. But again, every study defines this a little differently. Nonetheless, that NAC and AARP survey estimated that there are probably over 34 million Americans who have provided some sort of care to someone 50 or older in the past year. That's a lot of Americans. And you can see here that some of those caregivers have been doing this for a long time, more than a decade. Some of them are themselves older. And 40% of them are male, which is often overlooked. So some reasons why we really need to keep doing research on family caregiving. I'm going to argue first that there are still limitations in our knowledge base and our theories that need to be addressed. And then I'm going to talk about how rapidly changing circumstances are for families these days, and that they're going to pose unprecedented challenges for families who are caring for someone who is older. So limitations of existing research. We do have more longitudinal studies now than we ever had, certainly when I began, and that's wonderful to see. And we also have some great advances in statistics 
to allow us to analyze longitudinal better, data better. Um, and yet, most of our research is still cross-sectional. And the longitudinal research that's been done does have still some remaining limitations, as you can see I've suggested up here on the screen. Our theories also have not kept pace with our methodological advances. So our methods are much more sophisticated about what we can do to look at longitudinal consequences of caregiving than our theories are to match them. There are also more dyadic studies, and those of you that know me that I'm passionate about both longitudinal research and dyadic research. So we do have a growing body of dyadic evidence about caregiving experiences of families, and yet even there, we have some real limitations. We still do have many studies that are single informant. And if two people in the family are included in a study, it's quite frequent that we don't talk to the older care recipient, him or herself still. Um, also, I want to point out that in this area, theory has not kept pace with the statistical advances. So we can do very fancy statistical methods now on dyadic research and even on research with more family members than just two people, uh, but we often don't have the theory to guide that research in a beneficial way. We do have limited research still that talks about how providing care to an older person interfaces with other roles. So if we look at anything, we still look at employment, Although even there, we're often just looking at whether the caregiver is employed or not. We have a large body of literature now on work-family relationships and conflict. But I will point out that much of that work-family literature focuses on the impact of work on caring for young children, not on older adults, care for older adults. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done there. And there's still so much we don't know about what kinds of paid services, paid help, formal services can be beneficial to family caregivers. It's an area of active research to try to design interventions and test interventions, but we're a long way from knowing at this point what services really do have a beneficial impact to both the care recipient and the caregiver, how they have that impact or why they have that impact, and for whom they're most effective. We also know little about why families do or don't use paid help or formal services. Another big reason is that there are so many caregivers of different types who are just not well represented in our research. And I list them here, and then I'll show you some more on the next slide. So we really have all kinds of caregiving going on that we don't see reflected in the published field. There are some people here on campus who are doing some very important work, though, around grandparent care. So Carol Musel over in nursing, for example. Uh, also some nursing colleagues who are looking at long distance caregiving. So some of those are beginning to be addressed. We still have far too little representation having to do with racial and ethnic diversity in families caring for older members. These are some other people who are unrepresented, and hopefully those of you out there that are faculty at Mandel School can begin to see, oh, wow, you know, there may be some ways in which, as we're training our social workers on substance abuse or on adult mental health or whatever the topic might be, that perhaps thinking a little bit about family caregiving in later life could be a, a nice addition. And you'll notice here that I have on some of these said uh, caregivers slash older adults. So for example, here, um, there is a growing concern now with the opioid crisis about caregivers, family caregivers who have substance abuse problems caring for older adults and sometimes even taking that older adult's medications for their own use. So another big reason that I think we need to have research, as I said, is that families are facing some unprecedented circumstances. One of the most important of which is that the US population is aging. And even though age itself does not predict the need for care, as age increases, it does uh, bring about greater needs for care. So we do have an unprecedented number of older adults now. Those 80 and older are the fastest growing segment within the older adults. We have a growing number of people living to be 100 or older. But we also have, I note here at the bottom, 
some widening or persistent disparities in life expectancy that we just have not solved. The income disparity in life expectancy is growing exponentially. Another reason is that the population of older adults is going to be increasingly diverse. So whatever we learned about family caregiving from primarily white samples a decade ago or a few years ago is not going to hold in the near future as our population as a whole and as older adults in particular become increasingly diverse by race and ethnicity. And I point out here that, for example, we have limited research on caregiving among Latino families. And yet, Hispanics are one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing groups in our population. This one at the bottom is now up for grabs. So we had anticipated a large number, a big increase of older immigrants coming to the US primarily for reunification with their families. And now we have a whole new ball game with the political climate. Another reason is that the health and functioning profile for older adults is changing. So whatever we learned in the past about what the care needs, the health care needs are going to be for older adults will not necessarily apply to the new generations of older adults. So for one thing, uh, more and more older adults have multiple conditions that they're living with, not just one, although our health care system still tends to focus on one at a time but they have more and more multiple conditions or complex conditions that are going to affect their care. We all worry, of course, about increased risk for cognitive impairment with age. I point out there that we currently have four to five million Americans, older Americans, living with dementia at this point, and that risk does go up with age. And here, too, we have persistent health disparities that we need to constantly keep our eye on and try to resolve. Another reason for changing uh, research on family caregiving is this growing economic hardship for families. There are a lot of out-of-pocket and medical costs for families caring for an older family member. So we have great economic hardship for many families. Even now, it's going to probably get worse. We have widening economic disparity in our society. So I certainly hope we're not moving to a society for the wealthiest families can afford all the high quality care that an older person needs and the other families are left struggling. But it looks like we're headed in that direction. We often forget, given the safety net of Social Security and Medicare and so on, that there are many older adults living at or in poverty there are homeless, an increasing number of older adults who are homeless or who have food insecurity. And those numbers are expected to grow dramatically uh, in the not too distant future. And there too, I point out that there are important disparities that we need to recognize. So the poverty rate is much higher for older women than older men. It's much higher for Hispanic and um, African American elders than other elders. And we're faced with all of this changing at the same time that funding for services for older adults and their families is either stagnant, if we're lucky, or being cut. And all of us know, and I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, that health care costs are rising. And that's a big contributor to this economic hardship for families. And particularly families with an older family member are going to have to spend a lot on health care even with the backup from Medicare and Medicaid that there may be in place. And that future is a little uncertain about funding those. So we have increasing families who are reporting difficulty getting care because it's too costly, or simply not going for health care because they feel they can't afford it. Another reason is we're faced with rapidly changing organization of the health care system and how health care is delivered. These pose some particularly challenging problems for families. So just to point out a couple of them, um, we have an increasingly complex health care that needs to be done in the home setting. So more elders on ventilators, more elders needing oxygen, more elders needing intravenous injections, more elders taking more medications on a more complex schedule. So that's going to be increasingly challenging for family care caregivers who are typically tasked with providing that care in the home. 
In addition, a lot of family caregiver time is consumed by the fragmented healthcare system that we're facing. So a lot of time is devoted just trying to coordinate care for an older person. And lastly, I want to point out on this slide that families are often overlooked in healthcare still. So we talk about a more patient-centered or person-centered healthcare system. We're not talking as much about a family-centered healthcare system that we need to create. And in addition, family caregivers are often not trained or given the information they need to provide the care that they're asked to do. The last thing here I'll mention is changing family structures. So more and more families are changing in their structure. We have smaller families. We have greater distance between family members. We have a record number of multi-generational families and households now. And some other changes that you see going on that have important implications for who's going to be available to provide care and able to provide care in the future. So coming to a close now, I want to point out that we have a pressing need in social work. All of this has been pretty general, but we have a pressing need in social work for people to be trained to help address these problems. So you see there that the healthcare uh, social worker field is going to be one that's going to be, have many, many job openings. So students, if you're out there, master's students, make a note of that, that there are going to be many positions for healthcare social work. The National Association of Social Workers, NASW, estimated that we're going to need 70,000 geriatric social workers uh, by 2020, which is right around the corner now. At the same time, they had evidence. I couldn't find anything more recent than 2005, but at that point, fewer than 10% of social workers identified geriatric social work as their primary uh, focus of practice. And NASW in another study showed that probably 75% of social workers out there in the field practicing are in fact involved in some way with older people in their practice, but they are unequipped to really provide that care. They're not properly trained for that kind of um, work. And recruiting students to aging remains a, a real challenge for our school. So I want to wrap up with some questions. I mean, the first one is aimed at our dean and the faculty and the students who are here from the Mandel School. And that is, how will we, the Mandel School, prepare the future social work practitioners, researchers, and educators to deal with these problems that I've tried to convince you are coming and are here at this time? I also think that we need to think about how our research findings can, in fact, be translated into practices, services, interventions, and policies that would better meet the needs, values, and preferences of both the older person and the family. For those of you that are researchers, we need to ask ourselves, how can our theories, our empirical evidence, our research designs, our statistical techniques better incorporate the high variability and the dynamic nature and the interdependence that is so true of families. And then how can our research practice, education, and policies better address the complex and rapidly changing environments and social structural challenges? And colleagues in sociology, that's a nod to you, uh, the social structural challenges that families are facing. And lastly, how can these better promote inclusion, diversity, and social justice for both the older adults and their families? I thank you so much for coming. I would look forward to further discussion with you and challenge or whatever over, over hors d'oeuvres. Uh, it, I tell you, this was a brilliant presentation, uh, uh, Professor Townsend. I appreciated the lifespan perspective you. Uh, that mm -hmm. you brought, brought, brought to presenting your own work. And I think for the younger scholars in our audience, uh, she's just provided a brilliant model of how to build a career. 
uh, one that has had a focus that you can find back to 1982 to, to today. Not, and there was, wasn't a single path. There was a broad path. There were some little side paths, but there was a, a strong path forward. And the questions that you've posed at the end, uh, as I was looking at them, I was trying to, I was making my guesses of which papers am I going to see on each of these topics. But also she was generous in presenting ideas for all of us here and what we might follow up. And I see it as an invitation and a challenge for everybody to, to take that up. So, so thank you. It was uh, a brilliant presentation and an example of why she is the Ralph S. and Dorothy P. Schmidt Professor. Thank you. <laughs> and so people often ask, well, what do you mean a chaired professor? Now we're going to find out. So come forward alone. <laughs> How many were wondering, what is underneath this cloth? So alone, I'm going to ask you to help me to, to unveil here. And <laughs> so we, we have a, a university chair inscribed. Alone L. Townsend, PhD, Ralph S. and Dorothy P. Schmidt Professor, established in 1980. And uh, Peter, you'll be carrying this home, and this is, uh, this is what uh, alone we sit, come, have a seat. <laughs> no, definitely. Well, I want to uh, invite all of you to join us in the lounge area where we will have some hors d'oeuvres and we may find some of that wine so you can ask some of the questions uh, over wine as Alone is, uh, has invited us to. Thank you all. <laughs>